So I have been so lucky and so blessed to be able to um, talk to a lot of different financial literacy people in the last couple months. Um, and that led me to 403 be wise, which led me to Tara. And Tara is a fellow SLP and I'm excited because she's a, um, the first time I've talked to another SLP in this little um, niche realm of financial literacy. And I've just been so interested in all the stuff that you've been doing. So I just want to give you a second to kind of introduce yourself and kind of maybe we'll start with how did you get into the field of speech? Yeah, sure. Well, I also have to say before I forget, when um, I was listening to the 403 Be Wise podcast and it had the title Penny Pinching Pathologist and I was like, <laughs> I hope that's an SLP. And I was like, that name is so clever. So I was so excited to listen to that. Well, at first I was actually a business education major. So I've always had that um, like interest in financial things and money and things like that. So I started out as a business education major, which would be teaching like finance classes, accounting, things like that. And I didn't even know about speech and language pathology until I got to college. I honestly don't remember how I even heard about it, but I thought that it would be more interesting than doing a lot of like spreadsheets and bookkeeping and things like that. So um, eventually I just switched in undergrad. Cool. And did you go right into like, now I know you have this fun in speech like realm on Instagram and you share a lot of different um, resources there also, but where did you start? Did you start in schools? Did you start right away doing itinerant therapy? Yeah. So I started working for, I don't know if any other states have this, I'm not sure. Pennsylvania has something called intermediate units where it's a public education agency that kind of is responsible for a lot of resources for other schools in their multiple county areas. So one thing that our intermediate units are responsible for would be like early, um, early intervention. Okay. They, you know, handle all the early intervention. But another part of that is like autistic support classrooms for schools that maybe can't, they don't have the resources to handle that themselves. So the IU funds and staffs these, you know, specialized services. They provide a lot of trainings. They provide tons of just resources to all these schools in multiple counties. So I've always been hired by intermediate units. Um, and they, it's almost like contracting me out, but not really. Like I'm on the same contract as a teacher, but I go to multiple different buildings and I've always been like that across different intermediate units. So at first, the first IU that I worked for was specifically, it was one huge building that had all special needs classrooms because a lot of the schools in that county couldn't handle those higher needs students. So they had like a lot of autistic support classes, emotional support, MDS, all those were in that building. So I split my time between that building and private schools. And now for the new IU that I work for, um, I'm just at private schools. So it's been funny talking to different people, mostly in the education realm who are fami familiar with teachers. And you know, we'll, I'll try to explain that too, that like we're on the same step schedule, all of that. But even within speech, it's interesting to see <laughs> you know how it's different state to state and district to district so I appreciate I was trying to understand exactly what you were doing if it was itinerant like EI or what you were doing but it sounds like it depends on where the need is right yeah yeah it's it's kind of different everywhere and when I first started talking to other SLPs around the country like I just thought every state had intermediate units I thought everybody was like that and once a lot of people were like what are you talking about or how how are you employed or what like, people just didn't understand it and then i didn't understand it's like doesn't that's the problem yeah, yeah doesn't <laughs> why are you not getting this please yeah. but um they must just call it different things in different areas yeah i'm sure yeah so well that's interesting so how did you start then with fun and speech and can you explain a little bit about what that is sure um well in grad school actually I was always making activities and things and sharing them with other, you know, my classmates. Um, I definitely didn't have enough money to buy anything on Teachers Pay <laughs> Teachers. I remember I bought like one free stuff. <laughs> yeah, I bought like one four dollar thing, and that was like the biggest splurge ever. So I just had to make all of my own stuff, and um, 
two people in my grad class actually said that they, you know, opened up a store on Teachers Pay Teachers and they made like 20 or $30 in a month. And I was like, what? My mind was like blown. Um, so you're making it anyways, like, right? You, know, you should try to put some of your stuff on there. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's a lot of work because it wasn't just like you can put anything like there's a lot of like copyright things and kind of cleaning things up. So that's kind of how I started. I was like, if I make a couple dollars, that's great. And I actually just shared the other day that the first month on Teachers Pay Teachers, I only made $4.50. And I thought that was fabulous. I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. Um, and then it just kind of grew from there. Um, it takes a lot of work and time, but I kind of just got into it that way because I was already making a lot of materials and sharing them with other people. So I figured um, if people, you know, other people would find that useful, it's something worth trying to make a couple extra bucks. So mm -hmm. once COVID happened, I was like, oh, my business is gonna tank because most of my activities are like print and go crafts. Like everything is mm -hmm. print and go pretty much. Like that was a large part of what I did because being at, I'm always at multiple schools. Like I just said on my itinerary, at one point I was at nine different schools. Everything I needed, like I needed it to be quick, print and go. Um, so I was like, well, there goes like my whole business. But um, I kind of had to stat myself out of that. And I was like, well, no, people still need resources. We're all doing teletherapy now. So I like tried to learn a lot about more digital resources. I knew some things about digital resources. And then I actually took a whole course, a paid course on making boom cards and like all about boom cards. Um, and I tried to do that as quickly as possible. And then I just started like pumping out as many digital activities as I could because I personally needed them because now I'm doing teletherapy and I have no idea how to do that. And I know other people did. So I like just worked around the clock to get out as many digital things as I could. And like people obviously needed that and the market for digital activities, especially in the spring was much smaller. Like over the summer, other sellers had time to catch up and, you know, um, get into making more digital activities. So that definitely was like a turning, like a different part of the business and um, kind of picked things up just because everybody had such a huge need. Nobody had any digital materials and now we all needed all digital materials. So um, had I not, like, had I just been like, well, there goes my business, that's fine. I would have been screwed. I don't know if I can really say that, but um, <laughs> I, it would have been bad, but I was like, okay. And I let myself kind of wallow in that for maybe a day. And I was like, all right, I just need to do something that's on me. So that was great because I'm sure I'm not alone that I suddenly had to learn boom also and just learn how to use it. There aren't that many options right now that are quick and easy to like pick up. So boom was so smart to go that way and like figure it out right away. Yeah, yes, Cyber Monday. How fun. All right. So what are, you said you have a spinner. I'd like to see that. Yeah, that was one thing. Um, it's free. So if you sort by free, or you can do that price ascending, that would be fine. Because okay. it would start with all the free stuff. Oh, there it is right there. So I have two of those spinners and they're really helpful for people that are, you know, doing remote learning and things like that, teletherapy. There's, this one's for like more later goals. I have another one that's for earlier goals and they're all free. And the main reason why they're free, some all people- these targets them, are free? Yeah, some people sell them, but my whole thing is the. If this is on wheelofnames.com. Um, anybody can make their own spinners on there, but some guy just like does that site as a hobby. And my fear is, I've talked to the guy. My fear is that he's just not going to want to keep up with it anymore, and it does cost him money, and he's going to shut the whole site down. So if I charged for them, I would have to like refund everybody or something. So I just don't want to deal with it. I just made them all free for everybody. Have at it, and if they go away one day, it was good while it lasted. So how do you work it? So if you scroll you down, PDF like this. Yeah, if you scroll down, it it'll give you. You keep scrolling. There you go. Those are all the links. Oh, scroll back up. So you're gonna pick your target. There are links. So for working. And on then it. once you click the link, it will take you to the spinner. Oh my gosh, this is my new favorite thing. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm gonna do this all the rest of December here. So you tap it. Yeah, you just tap the middle and um, oh, you probably have to yeah click okay. You could like zoom oh in or. Oh my gosh, how fun. 
Okay. So is this set up? Let's see what do we have. Practice this word three times. Oh my gosh. Is it so I could probably copy and paste this link right into like Seesaw or something like that if I wanted to give them extra. How cool. Um, how about your itinerant work? How did that change with COVID? Like immediately everything shut down, right? And then how yeah. it now? Yeah. Um we went like we left one Friday and by the time I left work until I got to the grocery store, they closed all the schools for two weeks. And we were like, two weeks, but then we just never went back. It just <laughs> we were always closed for the rest of the year, like I think most people were. Um and we were doing a lot of packets at first. And for me in particular, it was a little bit hard because I'm at all these private schools and like, we don't have like a one-to-one -one initiative where every kid has a Chromebook or something. We have parents with five kids and one laptop at home and now they all have to do all their schooling on that one device. And while both parents are also having to work from home. So like anybody, it was a total disaster. But in our situation, it was a little bit different because in private schools, there are no IEPs. Like, it, it just, it is kind of what it is. We have something called service plans, but um, the parents were pretty much like, I can't keep up with the required work. We're not doing this extra work. And that was kind of like the reoccurring theme. And I totally got it. I felt awful. And we had to keep checking in. So we had to like prove right. that we're doing work. So I had to keep reaching out to these parents week after week. And I like flat out told some of them, I said, listen, I have to keep emailing you every week. Don't even open it. I'll put right in the subject line, important, if it's something, you know, like I really need to get a hold of you about, but I just have to do this. Um, so I really didn't do much teletherapy last year. Um, I may have had like seven people that were reoccurring, like on my schedule. And a lot of the rest of it was just like busy work or trying to help other SLPs on our team because a lot of them didn't really know a lot about technology. And I was kind of already like for making my own resources and doing things like that, I, I knew more about technology and how to make things um, than maybe other people had, but mostly what I was doing was a lot of packets, like putting together packets, putting together activities and resources and videos to go home rather than like live teletherapy sessions. So that was different. And now this year we've been back in person full time since the middle of August. So it's like normal, ther well, the new normal therapy. <laughs> yeah. So do you have everyone that's in person, are they all masked? Like, do you have to wear face shields or anything like that? What is your situation? Everyone's masked? Yeah, yeah. we do um, masks. I always wear my mask. We have the option to just wear the face shield, but I personally just don't feel comfortable with just that. So I always wear a mask. The students always wear a mask, but for articulation therapy, I was having them at times take their mask off because we have a big, like a huge plexiglass barrier at all of my schools. Our, work purchase them for every place we are and i had them take it off like only if we could really be like more than six feet apart to have them take it off for a little bit to do some articulation therapy but just recently like as of two weeks ago i stopped that i made them leave their mask on the whole time just because like with numbers rising and everybody i knew was going to be seeing family for thanksgiving and things like that like i just wanted to be extra cautious and we just had new mandates come out too i don't even think we're allowed to have the students take them off because before we were allowed to give them mask breaks which is what i was doing um and i don't even think we're allowed to do that anymore so now i think they have to have the masks on 100 percent of the time which is hard it's really difficult but mm -hmm. for a little bit well up until about two weeks ago also we have um clear masks just for speech that we'd keep in paper bags and we would like swap out for the clear mask so i could at least see what they were doing give them some feedback but about the same time, I was like, yeah, no, no, we're gonna go ahead and do the best we can with what we got with the masks on. I don't wanna be messing with masks on, masks off. So it is just scary times, but we're all adapting. Um, so, okay, so I ended up getting connected with you through 403BYs. Um, I found them at the beginning of COVID when I started getting like kind of down in the dumps about not having much um, control, much power over like helping my students. Like you said, I knew everybody was so overwhelmed and I saw like two of my students regularly and it was really depressing. So I thought I'm going to get a little project and start researching something. So at the time I picked pensions, like I have no idea what a pension, my pension really does. I know my money goes into it and I don't know what it's going to look like. So um, that's how I got into eventually finding 403BYs and learning a whole lot more. Um, how did you find them and how did you get, it sounds like you've been interested in this from the get-go because you were initially in this field of business. Um, administration. So how did you find 403BYs? How did that get started?
Um, I kind of, I was always into financial stuff, but never anything retirement related. So I was very big into like paying off student loans and like mortgage things and all of the other kind of aspects, more like debt. Like I was all about like different aspects of debt. So once we got pretty much debt free, other than our mortgage, um, once we started to approach that mark, I was like, well, now what? Because a lot of like you hear, if your mortgage is under a certain um, interest rate, you shouldn't even pay off your mortgage because you can get better returns investing in the stock market or this and that. So I was like, all right, well then, you know, kind of what's our next move? So I started looking into retirement. My husband always had a 401k, mm -hmm. um, but we just kind of would like up that a little bit here and there, but never really like got super into it. But this year then, before the school year started, I started looking into retirements, pensions and everything. And I was like, oh my gosh. Oh, this is, first <laughs> yeah. of all, a lot of information, a yeah. lot of information. It's not just like debt is kind of more cut and dry. Like once you figure out compounding interest, you, you kind of got your head wrapped around debt and things like that. But um, this was a whole different ballgame with all the fees and hidden fees and just you know, compounding interest in the opposite direction, you know, to build wealth and investing and the pension and how your pension works and all of that. I was like, wow, this is a lot of information. And then the other side of it is like that it's um, kind of muddy water for the 403B world versus 401Ks about, you know, how they're um, less regulated and everything. Um, it was just a lot to dissect. And then I wanted to start a 403B with my school. And when I asked them what their options were and did a little bit of research, they were all really horrible. Um, so then I kind of went down that route of trying to get better options and rallying the forces and whatnot. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I, oh, and then I was just trying to learn more about retirement because like I said, I didn't know much of anything about pensions. I didn't know much of anything about retirement investing. So I somehow came across the Teach and Retire Rich podcast mm -hmm. in trying to learn about things um, because I was just trying to learn, like, as I walk my dog and things like that, I was just trying to consume as much information as possible. So I didn't even, like, listen to podcasts before that. Um, and that's how I found the 403 BYs, and they've been so helpful. Mm -hmm. It's such a great community. It seems... I what are they about 1800 people so just you know not even 2000 people in the group but people are always there active and ready to help you and like oh post your details and we'll give you you know the insider scoop and like you said there's so much information it's hard still i mean you've been researching it for a while and i've been researching it for a while i still am like i'm not sure i need someone to hold my hand with this particular situation i need more detail um and i appreciate too that you've been doing that on the side of your fun and speech um, Instagram, you're doing a lot of like obvious speech stuff, but kind of heads up about credit card information, heads up about 403B situations. And it's just so good that like in our field, that's not really, I mean, I guess maybe that's not talked about that much <laughs> in American, I don't know, society, like, oh, this is why you need to be careful. Um, but it's particularly in the teaching world, it seems so predatory the way they have the 403B set up and so secretive with all the fees and, weird yeah. like i've the districts i've been in like i don't different contract work um year to year depending on where the need is i'm doing like sub work um and just the last two placements i've been asking more about like okay is there a 457 available and straight up like nobody in the union knows what it is <laughs> so like it's hard they're like what are you talking to me in 403b like no 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 so then you want to educate but you sound like a salesperson like no 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 we really need to do this and so it's just a weird you know it's a weird setup for us so I know, um, Tara, you were looking into 403Bs, you were looking into 457s, and you were having a really hard time getting more options. And you, as you were digging into some of the stuff that was going on in the district, you saw something funny in some of the paperwork. So would you mind sharing a little bit about what that was? Yeah, sure. And I think it's important. I've kind of, I mean, if people follow me on my Instagram, I'm sure I've said the name of this company, but I just won't now. Um, <laughs> but I was trying to get new options. And the thing that's very hard, and another thing like why you said it's almost like predatory and they make all these roadblocks is our union has a union endorsed vendor. That's the only vendor our union will not only back, but that is the only vendor that our union will even let like our members get information from. Like they want that vendor to be their only point of contact with any 
you know, any member for pretty much anything 403B related. They are going to back them 100% and they're going to not have any input. Like I was trying to get help from the union president to get a new option and he can't. They can't do anything. They can't help me do anything because they are married to this vendor and that's that. So that I thought was odd because in looking into this vendor, they had high front end loads and if people don't know what that is they charged 5.25 percent right off the top plus yeah. yeah every dollar that you put in you're losing 5.25 percent that you can never you know get compounding interest on plus like administration fees and things like that and i was like well that's odd that the union would say this is our best interest. So I started asking a lot of questions and everybody told me flat out, nobody has ever asked these questions. I was not anybody's favorite person, that's for sure. <laughs> I called I called PSEA, I called the very top people. I emailed all of them. Nobody would even talk to me. Um, but I was asking questions like, what is going on here? Why are these the ones that are endorsed? And they said, oh, this vendor negotiated on your behalf and these are the best prices. And even in talking with like Dan and Scott from 403 bys and all, I mean, when I was posting on 403 bys Facebook like every day <laughs> um, for a while and people are like, that is a bunch of baloney pretty much. Like there's no way. So that kind of made me think, okay, well, something's going on here. So my brother actually is a teacher and he is like the building rep for their union. Um, and he was kind of telling me about how he said, you know, if you would see the salary that these people make, or if you would see their expense for just like their trips, like what their expenses are just for like their trips that they go on, it's insane. So I called him and I was like, are these reports public? Like, can I just look over all their information? He was like, I don't know, they might be. So I spent a Friday night or a Saturday night just digging, Googling, trying to find anything. And eventually I found it because they are some sort of, public organization that has to report their spending or something. I forget exactly what it is, but I dug through and I did find that union endorsed vendor was paying our union large amounts of money, like seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 for sponsorships oh or oh, what was it too? I'm, I should have reviewed this before we did this, but it was kind of like, sponsorships or advertising things like that and no other we have eight vendor choices no other vendor was paying our union except that vendor you know that you know um union endorsed vendor so they were trying to say that they negotiated on our behalf and i was like that's a bunch of bs honestly it's because they pay you they're the only one that's willing to pay because somebody like lincoln financial doesn't have to pay because they're a big company that's well known they don't need that kind of you know they'll be on the list no matter what um, but like a smaller company like this one that's endorsed, they were paying every year to be that endorsed option. And once I found that out, that really ticked me off beyond belief. So, and I went to the union president, I went to all these people, nobody wanted to talk to me, nobody, half of the people I just don't think wanted to talk to me because A, they didn't understand it themselves, mm -hmm. B, maybe they didn't necessarily believe it. Like, why is this random 30 year old woman telling me that she just doesn't know what she's talking about? And then the other part, I think they were just like, she knows too much. We're just not going to talk to her and we don't have to, and there's nothing that she could do about it. So that kind of, that, that goes on more than people know that union endorsement and the unions are great. I have nothing but great things to say about unions. They're there to protect us. But that was the other thing I said, if, they're there to protect us. Who's making these choices? Does the person who's in charge just genuinely not know? Do they not care? Or does it come down to a bottom line? And a lot of these unions, they have 401k plans. So they're not even on our plans. They don't even like, they have no skin in the game. They have a better option than we do. And it just really ticks me off that they're messing with people's futures like that and really costing their members huge amounts of money and you know we could we should just have another option that's i don't I'm not saying everybody needs to be in low cost index funds but the people who want to be should be able to do that and they've made it extremely difficult to get a new option and i know i'm kind of rambling on but i'll just say this um in trying to get a new vendor added we had to get 10 people to commit to the new vendor and for somebody like me it's extremely difficult because 
I don't see any of my coworkers because we're all like contracted out to these places. So I only see two people that I work with and one of them I never get to talk to. We just see each other while we're passing by to pick up our students. She's a reading and math specialist and I'm the speech pathologist. So like as we're picking up students, I'm like, hi and bye. So how am I supposed to approach more than 10 people, you know, and get them to sign up. So right now we're at nine, we need 10, but it's really difficult because I don't see people. So I just have to like randomly approach them in their emails and I sound like a really spammy MLM or, you know, like, Hey, I just want to talk to you about your retirement. Did you know this? And it's, it's really difficult, but that was the other way in which the union couldn't really help because, you know, I said, Hey, can you like send this out to all union members? Because I don't even know. I don't even know all of our employees, you mm -hmm. know, I don't have access to that. And they, they really couldn't do much of anything because their hands were tied. And I felt bad for like our union president. It's nothing to do with him. He can't, mm -hmm. his hands were tied. So they made it very difficult to even try to get mm -hmm. a different vendor. So that union involvement is something that there are New York Times articles about. You could research that too. I sent out the New York Times articles to everybody because I was like, well, if you're not going to help me, then you may, it may have been in your best interest too, because now you've unleashed, <laughs> you've unleashed the beast. Yeah. The <laughs> Let me go and blast this New York Times article and then all of these receipts from this vendor. I mean, I didn't really do the receipts yet. I'm still kind of holding on to that. I've told people about it. It's kind of more in my back pocket. I've had to pull it out a little bit, but not as much. Um, but it's just, it's, it's kind of messed up. I was trying to go back and look at something you had shared that it looks like, I'm not going to say the company name, but it says, um, for an example, like a leadership conference sponsorship, um, yes. $5,700 sponsorship fees, $10,000, you know, different kinds of fees like that, that they're just, I mean, luckily it's out there. So it was there for you to find. <laughs> and yeah, to, it took a long to time. Day, yeah. I found it. <laughs> it's true. Well, good. Um, I know there's so many things like that. That seems like, I don't know, so many people, talk about how there was somebody in the you know staff lounge and they're there to help you and they they sell you something and they're really good salespeople and they're really friendly and that's why they're hired to do what they're doing they're really good at their job and they probably even believe this is the best product look at what we have you know so it seems like maybe the people in the union got sold you know something crappy <laughs> but they believed it was in your best interest and it's just not their specialty to really look into it but once it's brought to their attention, you would hope that they would be like, oh, this isn't necessarily in your best interest. Let me look into it. But I've heard the same thing in <laughs> unions stuff here that just like, nope, it's not done. Like for me, I was telling you about the 457 we were trying to, um, I was trying to get more information on. And eventually I found out that there's three people in administration who have access to it and that's it. <laughs> like that's yeah, meant that's for teachers. It's meant for teachers. Like what is going on? But nope, and no one's ever asked this before, and you don't need to, you know, do this. You know, this isn't going to be done. It's just not what we do in this district. So, ugh, gross, predatory. You know, like the, it's supposed to be a benefit to us, and it's passed on to the higher earners. Um, okay, so you did talk a little bit also about some of your experiences with, we'll say, fiduciary advisors, and how that was a little sketchy. And fiduciary advisors are supposed to be, again, putting your best interests in mind and not necessarily, necessarily trying to earn a buck. But what was your experience? Um, well, part of this whole like advocating and trying to lobby for new options, I met with every like I met with a rep from every single vendor, and I also met with some fiduciary advisors. Um, one of them too was our union endorsed or our union backed fiduciary. But again, as soon as you say that, now I'm out because I don't trust it at all now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because after that whole experience, so there, there was that. But then I interviewed a lot of people from the 403B Wise directory. So they were nationwide, not anybody local. And I tried to find a fiduciary that was local, but I'm in a somewhat rural area and there was only like one. And it wasn't through, um, what is it, the Garrett Planning Network? That's like one way to find a fiduciary and another one. There were none within like an hour, hour and a half. So there was just like one or two random ones um, that were local. And the one that I interviewed was very odd, like combative almost. And I was like, I don't know if... I don't know what his problem was, but when I was explaining about how, you know, I'm lobbying to get new vendor choices and whatnot, and he was like, well, what qualifications do you have to be making these decisions on behalf of everybody at your school? And I was like, 
none. That's the whole problem. Nobody's like, nobody, <laughs> nobody has making, qualifications. Yeah. yeah. Nobody is, you know, with any information. And like, when I kind of like came back with different things, he was like, Oh, Oh. And then I forget what were some of the other things I remember I posted about on the 403 B wise Facebook group. Cause I was like, I have to like write this down to digest. It's so good this. that you did. Cause so you can go back to it too and be like, Oh my gosh, look at what really happened. <laughs> it was bizarre. I just was like, what the heck? And I don't, I think some of it, like a small portion of it may have been, I'm a 30 year old woman. And I think some men are very intimidated by the fact that I know anything about finances. Not a lot. I don't barely know anything. But when I was speaking to all of these fiduciaries and the reps from the different vendors, a lot of them over and over, I can't tell you how many times I heard them say, nobody's ever asked this. Nobody's ever asked this. Nobody's ever asked this. Most people don't care that? about this. And it's so just, trusting. And then we all as a huge profession are getting screwed out of thousands of dollars because we just trust, you know, oh, it's I one thing. thing. Yeah. And I brought up, you know, the issue with the options we have and about fees. Um, you know, I said, you know, 1% may seem like, oh, that's nothing, but over time, you know, compounding, it really adds up. And I would like to, you know, I'm young ish. I would like to invest in, you know, some low cost index funds probably. And he said, oh, okay. So you just care more about being cheap than maybe potentially getting something with higher returns. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> hold on. And I brought up, you know, that like 92% of financial advisors don't beat the market. So why am I going to pay you like a hundred thousand dollars to do the same thing I can do by myself? And I was like, I'll show you the facts. You know, this is what research shows. And, you know, I think that this would work best for me. <laughs> no feedback. Yeah. And I'm not saying that this would work best for my 52 year old coworker, you know, like mm -hmm. this is just where I'm at. This is the, the decision I think that would be good for a lot of new, you know, um, incoming employees. But again, you go to someone that you think you can trust, you think they're a fiduciary. And instead of like saying, okay, let me educate you putting you in your place, like having this, like, no, this is what I'm here to do. You don't tell me how to do, you know, weird, just weird. It was. And another one, he was like, he didn't even know if he was a fiduciary. He was like, I have to check. And I'm like, well, bye. You know, no, I did, <laughs> I did stick it out. And he did actually give me a good bit of information, but I mean, it was just bizarre. So then I luckily, thank goodness, I interviewed people from the 403 BYS um, directory before these people, thank goodness, because I would have been like, are all of them this crazy? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and everybody that I had interviewed from the 403 BYS directory was amazing and so helpful and so kind and understanding. And I did end up hiring Brianna Reich from um, Wealth, of Conf Wealth of Confidence but it was from like their old website. They don't, they don't endorse anybody anymore because of their nonprofit status. So this isn't oh, really, okay. this shouldn't necessarily be live, but yeah, see it's through their .com. That's not on their actual website okay. anymore. So it's like an old link. Okay. So you can go here and find who they used to endorse, <laughs> but they yeah, see like here. Scott's on here and he doesn't even take new clients. Gotcha. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Brianna Reich, Wealth of Confidence. And I will say okay. one thing that stood out you know, you can see on here, it is actually a pretty good mix of men and women, but a lot of times it is, you know, predominantly older men in this arena. And um, I explained the situ my, our situation to everything. And Brianna was one of the only people that brought up the fact of, I said, well, my husband has a great 401k option. We're kind of just dumping all of our money into that until I get the 403b thing figured out. And she was the only one who said, I will caution you and you need to look up your state's divorce laws because in places like California, everything's, you know, communal property or whatever, and everything gets split right down the middle. But in other states, he may be entitled to all of that and you could get nothing. So you need to look into that and protect yourself because that happens a lot. And I was like, you know what? I appreciate that because I'm always preaching about things like that. Women need to protect themselves more than anything. I think that you should be protected more than your husband. I don't really care. <laughs> like, um, you need to really look out for yourself. And I was like hired, you know, <laughs> because sure, she just yeah. kind of thought an older man is not going to have that same frame of mind. Even if he knows and he tells me he's not going to really get it or get what it's like to maybe be in a woman's, a woman's position and always kind of in that power struggle 
But when she brought that up, I was really thankful. And I just knew, okay, that's somebody who has my best interest at heart and is going to, you know, just be a straight shooter and tell me things that I do need to know. So I did really appreciate that, but everybody was great and they all kind of offered things or did things a little bit differently. So it was nice to have different options and figure out what would be best for what we were looking for specifically. But what are some other resources that you found that have been very helpful to you? Whether it's websites, podcasts, books? Yeah, um, pretty much all of the above. I'll always reference 403bwise.org because they're just amazing and have been the most helpful. But I listen to a few different podcasts, obviously Teach and Retire Rich, which is their podcast, but um, random ones too, like money tree investing choose fi just i i just don't know them off the top of my head i just kind of click on them but i'll listen to different things like that i've listened to a bunch of different audio books um i've read dan's book one resource that i use a lot i think it's called bank rate bankrate.com it's just like the different calculators for investing so like an ira calculator 403b um, calculator 401k calculator that i use a lot because it really helps you see the impact and what happens over time with things like that so that's those are great resources just like retirement free retirement calculators and things like that that's awesome what about your plans for retirement what do you and your husband talk about for retirement i mean i know that's like probably way out there but yeah, I'm like, I can barely plan for tomorrow. But, um, I think it's hard. Honestly, I don't have many plans and that probably surprises people because I'm so focused on constantly planning for retirement. But and I'm like, I have no plans though. I don't know what I'm really saving for. But I think it's hard because the whole healthcare thing, that being up in the air, what if we have universal healthcare by then? That's going to be a huge game changer. What if we don't? What if healthcare costs are even more intense by the time I retire? What if, like, I don't, we don't have any kids right now, but we want children. What will the landscape kind of look like as far as when we have children? How old will they be when we retire? Will we have grandkids? Will our kids even live around here? What if they go to the military or what if they leave the area and they don't need us, you know, maybe they won't have us babysit our own grandkids, whatever, who knows? I think there's just way too much up in the air for me to really plan, but what I am doing is just trying to invest as much extra that I have now into our retirement. So we have plenty of options and we don't have to worry about anything. We could be very comfortable. We can retire whenever we want. We could keep working for however long we want. And if healthcare costs are crazy insane, we'll have more than enough money. If they're not, we'll have more than enough money to help, you know, our family or live very comfortably. So right now we're just kind of planning on keep doing what we're doing and one day we'll have enough stashed away that it won't really matter what we have to do or what we choose. It will, you know, we'll be okay. That's great. So not even necessarily having a plan, but like planning to have options. <laughs> like yeah, if you don't yeah. plan, then you don't have any options. You just have to do with whatever you can make work. Yeah. Um, yeah so that's a position I don't ever want to be in. Right. <laughs> um, all right. Well, do you have anything um, you can share as far as like maybe a big money mistake that you've made? or something you wish you could like go back and tell yourself 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Like, okay. Think yeah. About this. Yeah, for sure. I think one thing that I made a mistake in is like our society, or maybe it's kind of like more niche, but is so obsessed with this like debt-free culture. Like Dave Ramsey is God or something. <laughs> um, and I read Total Money Makeover a while ago and I was like, this is trash. <laughs> I was like the oh, only I person- Oh, I totally drank it. the Kool-Aid for a while. I'll, I'll swear to that. I did for a while, but- And I get it and I don't yeah. think it's trash, but- um, <laughs> There are elements <laughs> that are kind of trash, but yes. Um, but I was like, I don't buy into this. And everybody, but I mean, I kind of did. I just like did it a little bit of a different way. Um, I had my own Kool-Aid that I was drinking and it was a mistake. But the thing that I think is a mistake with the whole being so obsessed with being debt-free is you're not focusing on anything else. You're just having blinders on and some debt is okay to have. And sometimes other things make more sense. So one thing is I didn't ever invest. I had nothing in other than my pension, which is like nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, I never invested in my retirement because I always felt like if I have a negative net worth, then I don't have any money to invest. So I never invest in that was such a stupid mistake. And I keep trying to share with everybody, especially CFs, 
is that time is your biggest asset and now I'll never get that back. So even I could invest a lot more money now, but it doesn't even matter because somebody who has even less money invests less money than me right out of college is gonna have a lot more money than me now. So I just threw away such a big asset and I could have done both. I could have been super driven towards paying off my debt and also invested. And that was just such a huge mistake. And that's a lot of, I see it happening so many people and it's hard because a lot of people will say, well, how do you do it? Like, how do you save for a house, save for a wedding, pay off your student loans, afford a car. Like I've been there. I came from nothing. I've been like trying to open up more about that. But like I used to live in the projects. I grew up in like extreme poverty. Um, I, I, I get it. And it's a lot. And I think that part's hard is how do you possibly pay all this off and then also have money to invest? Like what? You just don't have it, but you really just, you've got to do it. You've got to look at your finances and figure out what can you cut? Like you don't need that Michael Kors bag. You don't need to go get your nails done. You don't need that Starbucks, quit it all. And you don't have to live like a peasant. Like we've always gone on luxury vacations and things like that because I'm like, that's one thing I need. All my clothes are pretty much from like old Navy clearance and I don't have any designer bags or things like that, but I'm going to go on a nice vacation because I need that. So it's finding a balance so that you can you know, save up and creating different expectations. Maybe you won't have this big, huge, lavish wedding, but guess what? It's a five hour party. Who cares? You don't need that. You know, your car needs to get you from point A to point B. And I think it's definitely okay to like splurge in some areas and treat yourself and spend more than what makes sense on certain things because that's what makes you feel good. But overall, you really need to be, you know, spending a lot less than what you're making and being really smart about your finances because it's not super hard. And you need to also hustle a little bit and make sure that you are maximizing your income and trying to do what you can, whether that be a side hustle, you know, doing PRN work on the side, doing anything that you kind of can to make a little bit of extra money to make your money work a little bit better for you. But you can't just be, you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses all the time. And I think that being in a field with primarily younger women, it's really hard because we're all starting from such a place of overwhelming debt and student loans are insane. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I got lucky in with being poor is I had a lot of grants and I didn't have a lot of undergrad debt, mostly just grad school debt. Um, but it's, it's hard, but you just need to do it and you can't put it off and don't be so hyper-focused on paying off all of your debt. You need to be able to kind of make a better plan overall because that's what I did. And now I'm in a position where I just like tossed away tons of money that I can never get back. So I've been trying to share that with, you know, especially CFs that time is your biggest asset, make a little bit of extra money. Even if you're only putting away an extra 20 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, Anybody, I don't care who you are, you could afford to put away 20 to $50 a month. And if you think you can't, come see me and I will show you <laughs> how you can do it because I'm telling you, you can. As long as you're making, you know, enough to pay your rent and feed yourself, you know, mm -hmm. which I'm sure it's barely, I mean, a lot of us, especially with our student loans, but you just need to figure it out. The thing that I think for me was really good about Dave Ramsey is you get to a point of such like a what is it like a consumerist type culture and you just get kind of blinded by the reality of shut it down stop it like you said the nails don't need to be done you don't need to have a designer purse you don't need to be going out to mcdonald's for lunch every other day you don't need, you know you don't need to be doing these things that hearing kind of that tough love kind of thing for a second um kind of snaps you into okay there's a plan i can follow the plan for a little bit but then kind of realizing i think a step beyond that once you start getting a little disciplined and getting in control of your money like you said look outside that like no one person has all the answers that are right for you and there's a lot of stuff that again he's speaking to a very specific out of control type mindset <laughs> and then it doesn't work for everybody like not everybody can do what he said or should do what he says you know or along with anyone else like even some of the stuff on choose fi i love them too but that speaks to certain people more than others so it's good to kind of reach out and get all of this from all different people so where can people find you? What are the best places for them to go look to kind of find? I know you're on Teachers by Teachers. We touched yeah. on that. Um, 
the best place would probably be if you had specific questions or anything like you wanted to reach out and talk to me one on one would probably be email um, fun and speech at gmail.com or on Instagram just fun and like at fun in speech. Um, I'm on those all the time. Um, and I post a lot of things on Instagram, like on my stories, and I've been trying to share more financial things and like making story highlights so that people could come back to it. So those would be the easiest ways to get in contact with me about these type of things not relating to speech therapy per se. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it so much. I appreciate you being willing to having this conversation and kind of opening up about your personal struggles going through some of this. Um, it's really nice to hear it from another speech therapist and a, a woman. You know, we're, we got to look out for each other. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. And you guys, I will link like all her email information below. Um, if there's anything else you can think of you want to send me afterwards, I'll probably wait till Friday to post this um, and we can kind of link everything but I appreciate it so much. Thank you very much, Tara. No, thanks for having me. And I just wanted to say thanks, like on behalf of all the other SLP women, because these kind of things are needed. And I appreciate that you're trying to reach out to other SLPs. I know you said you had a lot of, you know, just regular teachers and whatnot on here, but the more we can spread the word within our own, um, you know, our, I, can't even think right now like our own career I know, like our own field. <laughs> um it's really necessary because people just don't know and I've had a lot of women reach out that were like nobody's ever said this or I didn't I never knew anything about this or I follow all these SLPs on Instagram but nobody's once has ever mentioned anything about retirement or investing or anything money related and I mean I'm not going to go into like my own finances but I'll you know, share other general financial things. Um, so people just need to talk more about it. Like I'll talk about my salary, that's public knowledge, you know, things like that, you know, salary related, but nobody talks about these things. And I think it's extremely important as women that you need to know what you're doing because everybody knows somebody who's divorced. Everybody knows lots of people who are divorced or separated. And everybody knows at least one woman who got divorced and was left with absolutely nothing. And it's just heartbreaking that people have to start completely over and they feel like they don't have value because everything was taken from them. And there's a lot of ways that you can prevent that from happening, but you need to like know what's going on. Don't just say, oh, my husband does all the finances. Mm, he, yeah. He's gonna do all the finances in your divorce too. And guess what? You're gonna get left with nothing. So not that I think everybody's gonna get divorced, but I, I think even as a couple, um, it should be a lot more equal and you should know what's going on because even, your husband may have really great intentions and he may be doing something really, you know, boneheaded, you never know, but women really need to just be more in the know and take back some of that control. So for, you know, our field, that's primarily women. I think it's important. So thank you for doing this. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I hope we can make it more of a common thing and like talking about it and different speech boards and all of that kind of thing. It's because why not look out for each other? There's so many people looking to get something from you <laughs> that why not look out for each other, you know? Thank you.